Good morning. Always feels good to be here. To think back when St. Igalishka first started beside the tribal building and to see where we're at today. And also knowing that a brighter, better future is ahead of us. Because we have the future here in these classrooms that will someday lead us as a nation forward. But those of you that are here, Wopila Khelo. I just took a shila on Petukile and Kagalitapina, Ushukila, Poa Ketch, and won't spell Makatia. We took a Dako Ota Kiab, Dako Oti Wogala Kapit, Hoyoka, Woyuk Chash Teste, Ixer Chasha, Tokataka, won't spell Kata Kaliha money picked on Kha Woksa Pekile, Ijupina. Un spon kate ki le ka pha khi chupi na hoye che ki ki la un tho kata kya un un ajish agya un ka kha pik te cha hoye che a te wan o ya te ya hoye che li yuk chom i tho ka biya pik un hai na u che ha ka bo le ha hina ji pun kha a hoye che ta kush ka shka un shun la pina we chose Ani, we chose on a walk, on a Ochai Galekilena, on a Onean Kilena Kitchen Haskapo Hetcher, the Naho Yushkian, Wang Moni Pictolo Air, Chetok Panel Hennejelo, Wopila Prello, Mitako Yasin. In continuing, <clears throat> we'd like to uh, ask our tribal president, Rodney Bordel, to come forward and <clears throat> give a uh, tribal welcome. <clears throat> Rodney. I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to um, extend my appreciation and congratulations to SGU, St. Igleska University, for being here for 50 years. I know it's been a, a tough road, but I think when you look at the overall development of the university and what it was founded for, it kind of went against the grain of the uh, regular American uh, model of education. But it had to happen because we as Lakota, we need to have our own institutions. Have our own institutions to not only uh, record our history from our standpoint, but also to uh, I guess really pinpoint what we need in, in, in regard to education, especially the education of our youth. The Rosebud Sioux Tribe has um, been going since 1935 as an Indian Reorganization Act government. And we get a lot of, a lot of uh, I guess, ridicule in terms from some of the traditional people but yet, it, it's a government that's still going, and I, th I really think that we really need to uh, expand and really create our own constitution, our own development, 
the constitution that is ours and I look for the university to be a part of that development of that constitution and through these forums I, I think we can get a lot of knowledge that we can use to move forward in that direction. The problem that we're having, I think, uh, when we have a lot of ridicule and uh, condemnation of the IRA government is it leads to disunity. And we got to get beyond that. The only way we, as a people, can thrive or develop, only way we, we can really create an economy here, strengthen our, our land base, uh, really make our people feel proud is if we all work together. That's the only way. I've uh, been on tribal council for 12 years. This is my fourth term as president and really trying to put all these uh, forces together and creating a, a positive direction has been pretty tough. It's easy to get in there and get elected, but working with the tribal council, uh, working with the public to um, try to be part of a, uh, an effort to really strengthen our, our tribal government is, is, <clears throat> is, is really testy. But we all have to look that in that direction and SGU is gonna play a good part of that. We not only need educators for the elementary and secondary level, but also for the um, college level educators. We need business leaders. Uh, we need to create small business development here on the reservation, and that's wide open. We have opportunities here that really don't happen. We just need some young students with a vision and give them that opportunity to move forward. And we really need to take advantage of our young people. Political science, uh, government development, we really need to uh, create a department here at the university that can really look into what I talked about earlier, a, a model of tribal government that's ours, not that one that's passed down from the federal government. And we have all the knowledge here in this room to begin with and also throughout the reservation where we can create that model of government a good um, constitution that was based upon our own, our own work. We also need more uh, students in the social sciences area. In particular right now, the mental health. We need uh, licensed people to come out and help uh, our problem. We all know we have a huge epidemic of meth on our reservation. And we need to help those people who are affected by it. We need to get them off this drug. Instead of uh, kicking them off our reservation, disenrolling them, all the other talk that we've heard about, we need to work with our people and try to save them because they are tribal members. We need to always keep that in, in the back of our mind because they, are, they, have, they have families, they have children. And some of them are grandparents, some of them are parents, and some of them are young people just starting. So we really need a, 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 a new, I guess, a new wave of students coming out here to, to help our, our uh, tribal meth department because we have 16 beds right now and we need to expand it. There's a lot of other areas that we really, really need to develop as far as the tribe's concerned, but I just wanted to mention a few of them because SGU is a major part of this reservation, has been and it always will be as we move into the future. And the tribe's always gonna be here in terms of running a uh, reservation. Land development is another one. That's, uh, we need a lot of people with the agricultural background. We have a lot of money that comes to a reservation in terms of leasing our lands, that type of uh, business, but a lot of it goes to non-Indian pockets. We're creating a lot of millionaires on our reservation, on our near reservation. And why not turn some of that money around to uh, encourage our own youth to uh, become farmers and ranchers? It can happen. I just look forward to working with the university um, and, and going in a good direction. But I really want to stress this unity, the tribe and the college working together, bringing our people together. 
that's the only way that we can move forward as a, not only as a tribal government, but strengthen our university, help them to move forward and encourage them and provide the resources to them, whether it's the grants or just uh, tribal funding in, in some ways, but you know, it's, it's just a, a model that we have. We really have to educate our young kids coming up. I think some of our school systems are failing. In fact, if you look at the test scores, they are. So we all need to work together, work with the local schools to uh, educate our, our students for the future because we don't have nowhere but to go forward. And we also need to empower our own youth. I know we have a lot of history that, you know, Lionel talked about colonialism, they bring them out, out the papal bulls, the uh, doctrine of discovery, a lot of negative impacts that have affected us in a, a tough way. But it's good to know the, that history, how that happened, but we never ever should use that as a crutch or try to blame someone because that's beyond us. We're in a generation that uh, our young kids, they don't remember a lot of that stuff, so let's move forward as a people. Know our history, but yet move forward in a way that's positive because we have over a million acres, close to a million acres, and we're still trying to get to that three million acres that was taken illegally from us. So we have a good future ahead of us, and let's work together in unity and have a good, solid, positive outlook on life as we move forward, because that's the only way we can do it. Oh, Pilama Pilo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good words, good advice, good vision. And really what President Bordo was saying there is what we have to do. We can't continue in a manner by which we've had. We've done many remarkable things. But we also have the resources, but above all, we have the people, the intellectual power within our tribal nation. We have ancestry. We know what they went through. Anytime things get hard, all you have to do is think back to the 1860s, the 1870s, the 1880s, the 1890s. What were our people faced with? What was our leadership facing then? They didn't know whether they would have a future or not. Things look pretty tough. A lot of things that our people then depended upon were taken away. The buffalo was gone. Spirituality was being attacked. Our language being attacked, a school system, school system set up to really take these away, for the most part to try to drive the Wolakota out of us. But it didn't happen. <clears throat> We're still here. And as President Bordel said, When we think of those times, it's kind of like the inauguration that I had by about a dozen medicine men on February 3rd, 1973, when I was first inaugurated to be president here. Starting my 47th year here pretty soon. It coincides closely. In a couple of weeks, I'll be 80 years old myself. I still had a week to go on my 32nd birthday when I come here. I've enjoyed and I thank the Oyate 
And I thank those spiritual leaders at that time. And I thank Stanley Redbird, Sr. And I see, I'm glad that his son, Stanley Redbird, Jr., is amongst us. And I'm glad to see Grace Menard sitting back here at the drum. Grace's father, Bill, was also one of the founders, along with Isidore Whitehat. His brother, Albert Whitehat, was mentioned here earlier. <clears throat> There's a beautiful picture of that inauguration where Grace is handing me a pipe and Chief Eagle Feather, Bill Schweigman, is standing and moderating. And these medicine men are talking to us. And we had a ceremony there. And I was told, really, who we should be and where we come from by these medicine men and why they were involved in creating the institution. And as President Bordel said from the tribe, St. Degelishka University was designed to assist and to work with the people and to work with tribal government, to strengthen that tribal government and for us to sit down and what type of government do we want for the future that empowers the people, that addresses all issues equally, and brings all people together to work together towards those issues? That's where we're at. And that's what we need to hit hard on for the next 10 years and the next 10 years after that and the 10 after that. So that a thousand years from now, we can still say, we're still here. We're still strong as a Sichago, as Ocheti Shakoi. We're still Lakota and we're still standing strong as a people. That was the aim of our ancestry it was the aim of everyone in between there to the creation of St. Degelska University. And it's been an aim since then, and it will continue to be that aim. And as long as we're talking, aim will also spell that out and thank the American Indian Movement and all of its leaders, Russell Means and Dennis Banks, Vern Belcourt, the many others that stood with that proud organization and did what they had to do and to show the strength of the tribal people. We miss AIM, we thank them for what they did, and we know that many of them are with ancestry and will continue to be of tremendous assistance to we who we are in strengthening St. Deglishka University. I thank the man behind us, Spotted Tail. I thank all of our former leaders, all of their wives, their family, all of the people back then for continuing to be with us today in what we're wanting to do. And we give all them a moment of silence in Wopila. Thank you. And as long as we have a moment of silence in thanking somebody, I want to also thank those who have recently passed from here into the spirit world. We've had a lot of people who have gone on to the spirit world. We'll ask a moment of silence for them too but we'll also include 
one particular individual who I really come to honor and to thank for what he did. Yesterday, we had tragic news that one of the greatest athletes in basketball history passed into the spirit world, Kobe Bryant from the Los Angeles Lakers, along with his 13-year-old daughter, Gigi. I've been a Laker fan since I was eight years old, and today I'm still a very strong Laker fan. But it's gonna be a tremendous loss. It's how tragic it is for his family and for sports world throughout the globe. And as I said, for our own relatives and friends, along with Kobe Bryant and his daughter, Gigi, another moment of silence, please. Ashtelo, Popila. Yeah, this, uh, there'll be many follow-up meetings in discussions, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be sitting down with Rodney and tribal government, and treaty people, community chairs, community people, but also our students, students from little ones on up. I'm amazed at these little students who are four, five, six years old, how much they know about technology. I have a phone, and I can answer it, and I can dial it, and I've learned to submit a, a written message on it. But that's about it. The little Kakojas can come and ask for my phone, and amazing what they can do. And they start telling me about this app and that app. Talking so, Ashley, I don't know nothing. But I'm just amazed at their technology. And their intellect. And I'm, uh, in the audience, I'm glad to see he was here earlier. Richard moves camp. Richard's kind of a rarity. He's a spiritual leader, a medicine man, <clears throat> but he's also a graduate both his baccalaureate and his master's degree from St. Deglishka University. His mother's from here. I grew up with his mother, of course, she's a little older than I am, but very proud of Richard and the fact that he went to school here and he drove every day from Wambali. That's a, it's a fair distance from here when you're thinking about the winter time and what have you. But he hung in here. He thinks the world of this place. He's very proud, tremendous supporter. And he wants to be involved. And he wants to do it on a volunteer basis. And he's willing to drive every day, coming from Wambali to come back and to help us. That's a tremendous alumni. But that's a group that we want to use and utilize our alumni association. We have a tremendous powerful organization within our graduate students. Those who graduated, their parents, their friends. And as Rodney said, we need a political science department. We need to organize in this area. The things that our students, whether they graduated or not, the things that they can do for all of us. It's good to see uh, Florentine, Blue Thunder out here, Homer, White Lance, Royal, Thomas Yungapala. And I want to thank the uh, Oyate, those of you who couldn't make it here, but are listening in on YouTube. And for those not familiar, and I'm not familiar with what I'm going to read you here either, 
but it's written out here in front of me. If you want to listen to YouTube, go to www.3w's.youtube, one word, dot com slash user slash Sitegalishka YouTube, all one number, small print. Last year, we had these televised throughout the world in our Wachipi. And I was amazed the calls that our people received or were connected with on their computer, internet, operating Roger and Stormy back here. We had calls from, you get a lot of support from England, France, Germany, Italy. But we had calls from Whitehorse, not the Whitehorse community out here, but there's a country called Whitehorse between Alaska and Canada. We had calls from Newfoundland, that's the north of Northeast Maine. We had calls from Egypt. We had calls from India. We had calls from Japan. And we had calls from Siberia. I'm thinking, my goodness, who knows us in those places? How do they know enough to tune in as to who we are? And I guess this is kind of what uh, Stanley was talking about earlier really how well known we are throughout the world. And this goes out to the effort and the support from our Oyate and our friends, both locally, regionally, nationally, and globally. And as Chairman Rodney said, we need these, some of these departments. But as part of our planning, we also intend to get involved internationally. We do these student surveys, and a lot of these surveys express an interest in the international world. But there are just so many things that await us, but we need your ideas. How do we go about strengthening St. Degelishka University even more so? As I look out the window and I see the old boarding school dining hall that burned here recently, we will continue to work with facilities, taking a look at student housing, taking a look at faculty and staff housing, we have a lot of land, we have a lot of timber. We ought to be able to make really some fine houses, work together with the tribe and take a look at the SWA and their buildings and expand our carpentry program to log building. We have a lot of logs in the Black Hills. I know if we went to the forestry, US forestry and asked for some of those logs I know they would give them to us. They did once before. We have to come up with the transportation to bring them down, but we did at that time. We asked the uh, National Guard to help bring those logs back, and they were willing. So we could have really a powerful home building initiative here on the Rosebud working together with the communities, the tribe, and ourselves, and others. Business, Rodney mentioned, we have 1.7 million acres of land. That land is largely leased. We have 19 pivots, or we did. We have an opportunity to really get into agriculture and farming big time. 
not only economically, but also through nutrition. Growing our own food, growing our own potatoes, our own corn, our own vegetables, and helping the people out with what we're growing on our own land. There are just a ton of things that we can do and need to be done. And that's really the hope here. We have recorders sitting in here. We have, it's being videotaped. But we need ideas. But we have a lot of these on the drawing board already as to what we're going to do with these areas. And I want to thank uh, Les and Chad back here with Rock and Kay, as well as uh, Grace Bernard. As I said, she was at my inauguration way back when. And uh, Grace was, I think, uh, she said at that time, I don't see here, but I think she was 12 years old. She said, uh, at that uh, inauguration in 73. But we also want to uh, do partnerships with state institutions. A lot of state institutions want to work with us. South Dakota State, University of South Dakota, School of Mines, Black Hill State. And there's things that e each of them can offer. And we want to get into online course development so that we can take our courses to the communities. I own Thomas Chunkla. Good to see I own Quigley here. One of our longtime staff members and we miss her, as is with uh, Stanley Redbird Jr. They were longtime staff members and we miss them. We need to uh, we need to bring them back. We need to strengthen our Lakota Studies Department. We're in the process of redeveloping and taking a look at ideas, what we can do to develop a strong Lakota Studies uh, Department. And we're working on that, but we need a lot of ideas and we need a lot of help there. But that accreditation I mentioned, that's a big one that we need to address. We have to have it. Otherwise, we could talk self-determination all we want, but until we own education, we can't do the things that we want to do. I mentioned earlier, we were going to do it, and they told us that our graduates couldn't be teachers in a K through 12 system that was certified by the state. But now we've proved who we are, that we can do it, and we need to bring all of our educational systems on a reservation together under one umbrella. We can all have our own identity, but we all need to be in sync on the curriculum that we want all these institutions to do so that there's a steady line of who we are in our school system from the time of that little one. And that education should even start before that little one is born. While that little one is still with the mother, we need to be talking Lakota to that little one and keep that throughout that educational program. Just in short, I will go, uh, we'll continue here and we want to, uh, we want to talk about language. And I see any number of people in the audience who are Lakota speakers, who've been here before, and how many of you uh, want to come up here and talk about what it is that you'd like to see and what you can bring to the table in terms of our language, our best practices, 
places there where you've taught the language here or somewhere else, but we need to reignite that whole area and see how we can, uh, we can strengthen our language and how we can keep. And what is it that you recommend that we should do, both in a household as well as in a school or elsewhere? I remember when years ago we went to the Maori country in New Zealand. And they had just got done suing the Queen of England for failure to provide an adequate education. That's something that might await us. We might have to do one day. And they received probably, they won a judgment of about three quarters of a billion dollars. <clears throat> they took that money and they invested a lot of it into education. First of all, they bought three universities and they turned those into Maori universities. So that when you walked into one of those universities, you knew you were in Maori country, you were in Indian country. All of their architecture, everything that they had was the Lakota that they were. And they have their own name for themselves. And then they bought a backpack for all of their students. They bought and created language tapes. Language, they created history. They created the ceremonies. All that you needed to do to know to be a strong Maori or a strong Lakota. They put that into some kind of a technology. And they passed that out to the students so that the students had access to information about who they are 24-7 through everything that was given to them. They no longer had to go to a class to learn the language. They can turn that language recorder on and they could be, they could hear the language, whatever else they were doing. And we went there 20 years after they started this. And they had these immersion camps and the language was coming back. They were bringing who they are as a tribal Oyate. They were bringing that back because for a while there, they were losing it. If you ever see that show, Once Were Warriors, they didn't like that movie. It portrayed them in a very negative way. But they said that there was truth within that movie. There was a lot of drugs, a lot of domestic violence, and they wanted to get away from that. So they declared war on themselves. And they went about bringing who they are and who they were. And now they're starting to, to be very strong again as a tribal people. That's something that might await us. I had a man in my office the other day. He's probably in his 60s. Many of you know him if I were to name him. Isidore Zephyr. Been sun dancing since he was a young teenager. But we were talking about, he was mentioning Humblechang vision quest sitting on a hill and I was telling him that there was two individuals from here who were telling me that in their vision quest that in the, on a hill mountain lions would come up to them and sit with them at night early next morning those mountain lions would leave 
And he said, Lionel, I had something happen to me that, yes, it scared me, because I didn't know what was happening. But I was honored once it was explained to me. <clears throat> he said he was on a hill praying, he had his pipe, and he heard these heavy footsteps behind him. And he wasn't about to turn around because he thought it was a horse or, or a, a, a cow. But pretty soon he could detect it wasn't, it didn't have four feet. It had two feet. And it got close to him. It was about 10, 12 feet behind him about five feet off to the side. And it started talking Lakota to him. And that voice was coming from way up here. And it identified itself as Wiwila Wichasha. Wiwila Wichasha, my understanding in Lakota is who we know as Sasquatch or Bigfoot. And I hear from a medicine man in Santi that we really Chasha approached them and told them they didn't like people using that name, Bigfoot, to talk about We Wheela Wichasha. But the message that We Wheela Wichasha had to give to Isidore was astounding. He said that the Wiwila Oyate was concerned for their fellow two-legged relatives, meaning us. That there was too many things that were happening on our tribal homelands that should not be happening. And he mentioned these. I don't need to mention them here. We can, we know in large part, or we can use use our own imagination, things that are going on. But that the Wiwila Oyate was concerned and they wanted Isidore to go back and to spread the word to our spiritual leaders, to start coming together, to start having discussions with each other, to talk about how they're going to address the future and the things that we have to do to begin to come together as a people, as educators, as tribal officials, as programs, program directors, whatever it takes, we have to mobilize this leadership and create this plan of action that we're talking about. Rodney was talking about it here. I'm talking about it. I know you're talking about it. I know Florentine stood pretty much where he's at last year and talked about it. But we got to get past the marketing and we need to mobilize. And how are we going to do it? What in particular are the steps, the things that we have to do to begin to get away from what we will which Hasha was telling Isidore. And I guess I, I put that out, and that's why last year on this agenda, we had here spiritual healers and advisors invited. At some point here, I'd like to see, we would extend the use of this gym Wherever, however, this is up to those of you who are in this particular circle, how you want to go about best coming together with each other to talk about the future. Much like Stanley Redbird Sr. did when he was going to come up with this institution, he started meeting with medicine men, spiritual leaders, and they sat together and created, conceptually, this institution. We have to do that with medicine men, our spiritual healers, 
and create an updated vision and a plan of action for our future as a people. So don't know those you then us this that way I got the cup. I bet you know how you want to see this, you want to see this. I can't just know this way I got up. Well, here it is. You pray, and get you know. Don't get too challenged. Don't go that way. It's just going to hit you. Oh, na hell. Yeah, hit you. So with that, I'd like to uh, open the floor. And you don't have to take these in any priority. If you want to talk about language, that's fine. If you want to talk about sacred sites, if you want to talk about treaties, you want to talk about song and dance, the floor is open to address any of this. If you want to go to a Facebook page, just go to St. Eglishka University. So with that, the mic's open. If you want to come here, or if you want me to take the mic out to you, if you've got access to a mic, Homer. Homer and I got cash. Enough. Elushni. Well, there's a mic set up back here. You can go and you can uh, you can utilize that. Uh, what's that? You could, yeah, somebody can take it to you. If you don't want to uh, come up here, somebody will just raise your hand and Cheryl or Stormy will uh, take it to you. Ben? They'll uh, introduce themselves and uh, Tell what's their uh, subject area. Hello. Oh, the other was there, the cockpit. Hey, hey, me ah, when we talk here, all the imagery. Mila, Mila Haskai, Mount Chapter, Ben Rod, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. And uh, I'm not sure how close to be to this thing. Hey, there we go. We got a call the other day to come. That was on Friday. And 9 o'clock, they said, so we said, okay. And uh, I'm just going to say a little bit because I've got to go help call out Richard with a ceremony real quick. So I'm going to mention a few things. But then Jennifer Galindo is going to also talk about a project that we've got going on and research that we're doing out of the Historic Preservation Office. Research that is very significant, in particular how it affects the history and prehistory of the people of South Dakota, the peopling of South Dakota. So there's a lot, there's a lot that we're doing on many levels. I want to mention, as part of our project, one of the things that we do is drones. I remember coming into this building right here about six years ago. And Keith Fielder, my he has gone on 
And I mentioned his name with respect today. But we came in here, we called over and they said, yeah, you can come because we wanted to play with this toy. Not really a toy, it's a tool for helping us do our work. So we came in here and we flew it around in here. Just right at the last, I was trying to land and I remember crashing into that little corner wall right back there. <laughs> Broke one of my propellers right off the bat. But I remember, because we started to learn, we were the first program of the tribe to get one of those, to have a drone. And we begin to build. And we have, an, we have two today. One of them is also an infrared. It's a lot of money for that thing. But I've encouraged other tribes of our relatives. And I'm mentioning that because I want to really thank the Flandrusu tribe for coming with their drone program people and helping us and their ground penetrating radar. There's a lot of things that we do, and that's with burials, that's with surveys, all the things that we do. People have no idea what trip tipos do. No idea. And that's for every tribe. It's extensive what we deal with because we have to deal with the National Environmental Policy Act. We have to deal with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act and the other different sections under the National Historic Preservation Act. An adage that I've given to the Tippos throughout the Northern Plains, and it's a short adage, but it's very powerful in what it means. If you do not know your past, then you cannot understand your present, and you cannot make a future. It's very simple. I'm not saying this in a very preachy mode or whatever. I'm saying it because if you don't know that past, you can't make a future. Humans all over this earth destined themselves by making the same mistakes of the past. This is what has defined our world. Why am I saying it that way? Because we continually make the same mistakes because we didn't learn from that past. But when we remember it, the good things that Lionel and, and uh, <clears throat> the different ones have been talking about, if we understand those values, Lakota Wichuhale, a way of life of a whole people. Uh, now we move to the to the day because what the historic preservation do, office does for you is this. It's real simple, so to speak but very, very in-depth. Last year, 2019, we conducted 80 surveys here on the reservation. Out of those 796 acres were intensively investigated. We responded to 319 federal agency requests for comments on projects throughout our homeland. We commented on 1,256 private projects. Now you take and divide down 365 days a year into that 1,256 and see how much we do. And that's just a small part. 
that's the paperwork sitting at a computer and answering and answering and, and arguing and creating a future for us and our young, in particular the young students here. We deal, we have Peshla in the Black Hills. The Historic Preservation Office, we are administering to that and also with the Rosebud Sioux Tribe Game Fish and Parks Department. We're doing a range compliance, something that Lionel mentioned. Range compliance. We're looking at all of our lands and our leasing that Rodney was talking about. What's going on? What has happened to us? Why aren't we a more, more affluent than we are right now? And it's because of things that we are looking at and we are going to be a part of correcting for this tribe. We have Carlisle. I'm dealing with Carlisle right now. Carlisle Indian School, where 11 of our people are buried. They are going to be brought home this summer. June and July, it's going to take one month, but we're going to bring them home. And we have others. After Carlisle, we're going to deal with Canton. Canton has is a, was an institution Canton, South Dakota, called an insane asylum, or sanitarium. They, they put fancy words on this. But it still was an institution, of, basically, of incarceration. We're going to be dealing with that and bring our dead home. We're working with a researcher out of Middlebury College in Vermont. And she has done 15 years of research for us. So we're going to bring them home too. We're dealing with Genoa Boarding School in Nebraska. Our dead that are there. And the ones we want to bring home. And a number, a great other number of boarding schools but to bring our dead back. Okay. Um, <laughs> when we work, we deal with 23 federal agencies, 23 of them, DOD, Nuclear Regulatory, BLM, Bureau of Reclamation, blah, blah. I mean, there are so many of them. But that's within our homeland. Now, we have to also be aware that we deal with treaty lands. We deal with our, with our reservation lands at present. But we have a homeland that extends all the way to Virginia, to South Carolina, to Mississippi, to our southern relatives, the Osage, to the Oto, Missouri, to our other relatives, relatives all among the, up in Canada, to the Stony. We have a huge, huge homeland. And there are thousands of projects that we deal with as THPOs. We deal with them because they affect our cultural patrimony and our history. Students, those of you who are students, really encourage you to look at what the history of your people is. The oral history, the physical history, and the intangible history. There's a very significant part to that, and that is that word intangible, because we have connection via spirit to many places, to many resources. 
Hence, what is happening right now when I'm dealing with NEPA, with what Mr. Trump is doing, it's going to affect us greatly in our ability to protect, protect our past, protect who we are, so that we can create that future. There is so much I'd like to talk with you about. But I have a, a colleague here, Jennifer, as I said. She wants to talk about a project. Oh, and I, but I do want to mention one more thing, and that is He Dog School. He Dog School, when you look at the building, is a very significant structure. It is one of the only one of its type on the Northern Plains. There are several down in the southern, southeastern states. And they are where it came from a, actually they were built for black students by a benefactor, a philanthropist, who assisted them with creating these, at the time, ultra-modern buildings. Ours is significant. It is going on the National Register of Historic Places. It will be utilized again for cultural and language purposes. We're looking ahead. We're looking ahead at what we need to do, how we need to do it. There is so much, like I said, that I wish I had more time to, to work with you on or to speak with you about but they asked me right after I was coming just before I came here to help with some relatives who have a wiping of tears I'm glad on one level as I finish up that Lionel mentioned Siberia because I was in Siberia in 1995 doing some work and I talked with them because they wanted to create a liaison back to the native people here. And it was a library in Yakut. And <clears throat> that librarian spoke really good English. And she was the head librarian there. And she wanted to create a liaison to the states, to the native peoples. I told her about Sente Gleska, so when you mentioned that, that really surprised me. Because I didn't know that they were, they had followed up and they're listening in. That's powerful. It's strange when you think about it, 25 years later, you hear that something that was done way back had an effect, had a, there was some reason that that lady asked that. And I can only remember her first name. Her name was, I remember her name was Ludmilla. That's all I can remember. Can't remember, I, mean, I couldn't pronounce her last name anyway. I just, I just hope and encourage you students to look, look at your cultural resources your programs, through Lakota studies, through Native American history, what, whatever, whatever is offered, find it. Find something for yourself within what you may learn from those courses. I have my masters, masters of science. I'm also a member of the Register of Professional Archaeologists out of Baltimore, Maryland but it took a lot of academic work to get there. A lot of work, hard work. But it's worth it because you can become part of things that help to shape a future by looking at that past and having an understanding of it. 
So with that, with Lionel's permission, um, concurrence, J Jennifer, if you would to talk about our project real quick. Thank you. Just kind of waiting for him to turn the lights down so we can see. I brought some slides to to show our project. Mm -hmm. There we go. Maybe a little darker. Huh? Can we go a little darker? All right. Okay. okay, I don't know if you guys can see it, but I'll just go ahead and start. It's kind of, I guess I didn't plan it well. It, it, it's kind of better when it's darker, but my name's Jennifer Galindo. I've been the archaeologist at the Chival Historic Preservation Office oh, since 2012. Before that, I was the archaeologist at the Sichungu Yati Land Office. And before that, I was here at SGU at the um, Heritage Center. So I've been here a little over 20 years doing this work on your on your homelands here and that's yeah, been great. Um, I was just going to talk about one of the projects that we recently did, um, kind of recently. The Back in 2012 you guys probably remember a big fire went through the timber reserve area and it burned 43,000, over 43,000 acres. It was called the Longhorn uh, Wildfire. And after that wildfire went through, we got some large field crew together and we went out and surveyed because the grass was, was burned and we could see the ground really well. And it led to the discovery of a lot of cultural sites here. Um, the previous slide, can we turn the lights down a little more? We really kind of have to see the slides. If we could get it dark, huh? Uh -huh. Uh 
Uh-huh. Okay. The red line indicates the um, the area that was burned in the wildfire. And it's kind of um, oh, just west of St. Francis, southwest of Rosebud. And we started to survey in 2012 in the autumn after the um, fire went through and continued in the spring and summer of 2013. The yellow areas here show the area we actually surveyed. It was a little over 21,000 acres, so about half of the burned area was surveyed. <laughs> yeah, you can't really see, <laughs> see them here, but you, we have a lot of people lined up um, walking transects. So this is some of, my, of our crew, Tanner and Phil, and I think we had probably about 15 people um, working on this survey on this crew. And we all line up about 10 meters apart, and we walk together for 21,000 acres. <laughs> yeah. And these, um, each of these dots show um, a location that was, something was identified there, an archaeological site, a cultural site, a uh, site. And over 2,500 locations were identified during this survey, which just shows how, how this area was used so extensively for so long. After the survey, we went through and to do further investigations, we did some testing. Several sites, oh, over a half dozen, were disturbed by the dozer lines that cut through in the fire suppression activities. So if you can see here, these guys are setting up um, a grid with the string, one by one meter grids, and that's what was excavated. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the grid that was laid out with 25 one by ones, and the areas that are hatched, those little uh, quadrants that are hatched are the areas that were actually test excavated. This site was called the Hilltop Site, and it's just turned out to be a really interesting, really interesting site. Uh, this is some of our crew members doing the excavation. There's no shovels. Everything is done in incredible detail. We use trowels and record everything. You can see that each one of our crew members there has a, a paper next to them to map and document every single thing they come across. We're not just looking for stuff. We're looking for um, the context that it occurs in. So we're excavating in tiny little levels and documenting everything in the exact location and in the exact depth that it's found. And this is just an example of the detail of the recording. You can see on the right, that's what it looks like on the ground. He's got his, um, this was a crew member named Chico Redfeather, that this is his unit. He did an excellent, well, everybody did, but uh, an excellent work. And he troweled in a way that these items were exposed still in context. We call it in situ. And then he mapped it on the left. You can see the detailed mapping he did with every piece of stone, every artifact that he came across was mapped. And the, the depth below the ground surface where it was exposed was recorded. And that's what leads us to really learn um, what we needed to from this. It's not just about gathering items, it's about the context that they occur in. And the second year, this is Tanner here, working one of our um, pieces of equipment, a total station, to uh, get the elevation a little more accurate. <laughs> Some of our crew members, Ben Young, he was gonna come help us today with the presentation, but his kids had a doctor's appointment. <laughs> Cheryl Angel, Leah Rattling Leaf, and here's Tanner. He's with us here today. Oops. And after, when we got back to the office, there's a lot of lab work. When you do a, one summer of little test excavations like that, there's oh, months of cleaning artifacts, analyzing artifacts, cataloging them properly, storing them properly. So all the information that we gained um, is, is preserved. 
this, I know it's really hard to show, but that shows all the little tiny pieces of charcoal that were recorded in each one of those layers and each one of the features. And it shows that people returned to this one location over 300 years. They kept coming back and coming back and coming back to this one little spot on the landscape and living there. So 880 years ago to uh, almost 1,200 years ago, they continued coming back to this one spot. This one shows when we put everybody's little maps together of what they found, we put it all together. And like I said, it's really hard to, to see the slides here, but if you could see it, you would see that there were four um, pit, pits dug. And, and then the artifacts across the surface there. The pit features, each, we don't know why they were originally dug, but they were filled with trash afterwards, trash being old bison bone, pottery, broken pottery pieces, pieces of stone tools. Uh, they were just kind of filled with the trash afterwards. And because the detail that um, all of this was recorded, we were able to then um, do one layer at a time. 880 years ago, there were uh, three pit features were used at that time. And it connected to these chipstone artifacts, which everybody made their tools, of course, out of stone then. And I just wanted to take, uh, point you to the white um, knife fragments at the bottom. Those are associated with this layer 880 years ago. It's called a Badlands knife. It, it comes from a particular area. That stone's only found in a certain area in the Badlands. So that little piece of evidence shows us that the people that were living there had come from the Badland area, got that stone, made their knife, and then come here. Um, this one, again, you can't see it, but the, um, uh, it shows the way it was recorded, that that little Badlands knife was recorded in its exact location, still embedded in the wall, and that's how we were able to associate it with the occupation from 880 years ago. This is some of the pottery fragments that were found associated with that. Um, we had some analysis done for the residue, and it was found that they were, uh, the pottery was used for cooking bison bone and bison meat, probably making wasna. It looked like they were drying the meat. They were making the bone grease in the pots and preserving their food. These are some of the pits features after they were excavated. It's just kind of bison bone. You can see on the left, and if you go a little deeper, there were some horn cores down at the bottom of that pit. This is a stone feature that was found a little bit to the, to the east of the rest of the site, and it dated to this time period as well. And again, I just, I guess what I'm trying to show is just by recording in such detail, the drawing on the left is the uh, ben Young, this was his unit, and he drew each rock as he encountered it and wrote the elevation and collected the charcoal, and that's how we can connect this location and see that it was occupied at the same time as those other ones. This is the next occupation. This one dated to uh, 950 years ago. So the other was 880 years ago. This is 950 years ago at this exact same spot. And you can see a post still embedded in the corner of our excavation unit there. It turned out to be pine. It was identified as a pine post. So it's probably um, maybe a, a teepee pole or something. At first we thought it was probably a drying rack, but it's pine. So yeah, it's, it might be some kind of a teepee pole. It was associated with the other stone tools there shown at the bottom. And the same kind of pottery that was from the 880 years ago, the same style of pottery they still used 950 years ago. They created it by taking a, a cord and wrapping it around um, and hitting the clay on the outside, and you can kind of see the markings of the um, string. These are the artifacts that were associated with the next occupation 1,100 years ago. Again, just at this very same spot, they kept coming back, this one place, 
You can see a little arrowhead up in the upper left corner there. The tip is broke off. You can see the, the stone tools that were all made with what's called Shadron shirt cobbles, and they too come from a particular location in the Badlands. So we know that these people who were coming here and they had another pit feature there where their bison bone was thrown in along with their other trash. And, but these particular type of stone tools came from a location that we can identify in the Badlands. This is what one of the pit features looks like when we're excavating it. It just kind of a concentration of bison bone and rock and, and their trash thrown in. But by excavating it in um, great detail, we were able to associate all of this with this date of. Again, the same kind of pottery. These same people were doing the same things. 300 years, they kept returning. This is the deepest level we hit, and this is the oldest one. It dates to 1,190 years ago, and it's a bison bone fragment. And there were two little pieces of pottery next to it, a piece of charcoal next to it, which we could date and co connect it all together again. This just shows the, that the bison that were recovered from this site, they were hunting a nursery herd, probably in the fall, because there was no fetal bone. It was either female bison or young, aging from one and a half years old to two and a half years old. And this uh, shows, again, some of the stone tools. The first one and the third one is what we call moss agate. And they had this in all levels and all occupations over the 300-year period. And this is, well, again, I guess I'll just show um, what information you can learn from this. This is where the location in the Badlands where that Badlands knife, that plate chalcedony that I showed you earlier, actually comes from. And this is what it looks like in its raw source. <coughs> Excuse me. This map shows where the site is. If you can see on the lower left in Todd County, it says Hilltop Site. It's over there just south of Upper Cut Meat Housing. On the right, and then if you look to the where the yellow um, dot is, that's where the Shadron Chert cobbles came from. That's where that rock came from that they were making their stone tools from. As was the pink dot down at the bottom. That's where that moss agate came from, the raw material source for their stone tools that they carried to the hilltop site. And same with that red dot on your left. That's where that plate Sid chalcedony came from. By looking at this, we can see that this was the seasonal round. This is where the people were going. They were going to these different locations, getting their stone, and bringing them back here to the hilltop site, probably every year for 300 years. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and I'm just about finished here, but this is um, a map of other locations with similar pottery that's been found. And I'd like to say here that whenever archaeologists have found pottery off the Missouri River, we all know that the Mandan, the Hidatsa, the Arikara, their ancestors lived along the Missouri River in agricultural villages, growing corn, beans, and squash, and making pottery. So whenever archaeologists find pottery outside of the Missouri River, they automatically say, the Missouri River people came out onto the plains to hunt bison. They brought their pottery, and they went back. And so what we're doing here is kind of questioning that because we didn't see any Missouri River stuff. We saw that people were just living here. They're nomadic bison hunting people that just seemed to be using pottery. And this is Tanner. Huh. Tanner Hawk is here. He's helping me to address this question. He it's climbing up collecting clay samples. Um, what we did was we went around and collected clay samples to determine if the clay that was in the pottery at the hilltop site came from the river or it came from someplace local here. So we went around all summer collecting clay samples. 
This is a prairie pothole where one of the clay samples were collected that was located right next to the hilltop site. We kind of made these little tiles out of the different clay samples we collected. We probably collected 50 different samples and we fired them and then we did chemical analysis to see where the, where the clay had come from. This is the result of that analysis. It shows that the pottery from the Missouri River villages is what's all across the top and the lower left. The pottery from the hilltop site is all those little blue um, circles in the lower left, or sorry, the lower right side. They're kind of clustered in that quadrant south and right of the line. So that shows that chemically all of the pottery at the hilltop site is very similar to each other. On these graphs, it, it, it groups similarity. So the closer these points are to each other, the similar they are, and the further apart, the more different, the, the difference, <laughs> they're more different, <laughs> that's not even a word, huh? um, less similar in their chemical composition. So what this shows is the people did not carry their pots from the river. This one shows um, the results of the clay samples that we fired. And if you, I don't know if you can tell, but there's two little green diamonds there in the middle of all the um, purple triangles. The purple triangles in this one is the chemicals analysis from the hilltop pottery. And those two green diamonds is from that prairie pothole that Tanner collected a sample that's right next to the site. And all the other samples we collected are kind of scattered all over, but the ones from that prairie pothole located right next to the hilltop site was the best match. And that showed us that those people came right there, they made their pottery from the clay that's located right there. They didn't carry it from anywhere else. And then my final, I guess, um, slide here just shows your homelands of course this is your timber reserve area and how your communities today are grouped all around the edges you see St. Francis Upper Cut Meat, Rosebud all around the edges of this area and that this area was identified thousand years ago and even more but just from this one study it shows how important this area was a thousand years ago and that it's still so important all the resources are here everything that people needed were right here and you guys live in a really cool place huh. your ancestors knew I mean Spotted Tail he he left the Missouri River and really fought hard to to bring you back to this place and I just think it's really cool And I guess that's the end of our of a presentation. The purpose of this study, I guess, what it really showed was that we can, it's not all figured out. Archaeologists have been saying forever that the river, you know, river people came over. Lakota people aren't even um, considered as being, uh, well, at this time period, according to archaeologists, you're way over in Minnesota. And what I'm saying, I guess, and what we're looking at here is people always lived here. There's nomadic bison hunting people here. Of course, we don't know what language they spoke, but they're not agricultural people. They're living here. They're hunting bison. They just happen to make pottery when they, uh, to cook their food. And so we're kind of working on reinterpreting some of these old ideas that people have just thought that's how it is. And you're kind of uh, using these different scientific methods to question some of that. But I'd like to introduce uh, two of the people that have worked on our, on our crew here, uh, Tanner Hawkus <laughs> and Phil Little Thunder. Uh, and if they want to say whatever they're interested in saying, they did the work. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Tanner Hawkins. Um, 2017 I was finishing up high school and I was looking for a job. THPO was my first, you know, opportunity and so I took it and I got to experience um, 
you know, everything she said and everything we did, I thought was fascinating. So um, here I am three years later. I'm working as a GIS technician for THPO now, following up on the research we did. And um, yeah, I just hope to continue this work and I hope that, you know, the things we do is recorded and put in history, you know? So that's everything I have to say. So thank you. Uh, to acknowledge the Creator, first and foremost. Le Tokea Wiki Anata Le Me Ushi Chao Energy. Tanka Kaki Ushi Chao Energy. My name is Phil Little Thunder Senior. Um, I'm a I'm a grunt of the archaeologist world. I can feel the swamps, the forest. We look for we look for our past, our ancestors. When I, I've been on this job for 15 years, and to acknowledge our ancestors, as mentioned here earlier, we have to know where we came from, to know where we're going. Yes. Takes me all over the country, different people in different different areas of this United States and across the ocean. Learn from them. It's called cultural exchange. I'm a dancer also. Ceremonial dancer, powwow dancer. Carry the eagle feather, Chanupa. So this is just not a job for me. It's to acknowledge my ancestors. To know where we came from. And part of that is from learning from other people. Music. The Hokagabe. The Chanchega. Take that with me wherever I go. Stay away months at a time, weeks at a time. Uchekia. I give thanks to Russell Ewobear, Ben Rod, Jennifer, my teachers. I learned these ways. I, I, I didn't grow up knowing my ways until I put the plug in the jug 27 and a half years ago. So today I'm standing up here with gratitude for Mr. Bordeaux and this. Uh, I also attended classes here at one time. And the teachers that are here and the medicine man my nephew that was here earlier. And also, the nurses and the doctors, the courses that they take here to become nurses and doctors, to heal the people, spiritually, physically. But I'd like to share a short song to acknowledge our seven directions. It's called the Four Directions Song. But I added the seventh one because physically I have a bad heart, but you know I'm, I'm on medication, so I give thanks to my heart every day with coffee or tobacco, and to acknowledge the Hokagapi where my voice came from. Learn from my grandfather that, however it comes out, it comes out. You don't have to be a perfect singer, perfect drummer, or a perfect flute player. Once you make that noise, the Creator acknowledges it from above to help you. So this part I 
play to calm the heart, to calm the spirit. So people look at the flute as a sad instrument. I look at it as to calm my heart, play a short tune. Nariki Khuala to calm the spirit. No. Chancherak. Ina Ikta Mahali Akpaha La Nagopta. The heartbeat of Ina.
Juan Petu aste yo hape chichapia le ehani le o wai o aki el once pe wa kya kha ast hokel achi um takuma o agla kingte i own quigley in machapi ta head uh inawaki mary quigley na ha atewaki ish timothy chaba le to ha 1997, huh? Uh, Victor Duville, like she was, you know, huh? We just got the Lakers to jump. He knows that one. Uh, I'll talk English now. Uh, in 1997, there was a man by the name of uh, Dr. William Aker, and uh, an uncle, Victor Deville, who is uh, still with us. William has, oh, Dr. Aker has passed on. Um, I believe he spent like 32 or 33 years here before he passed on. But um, Uncle Vic is still very much here with us, and I really appreciate all the time that he gave. And within that resolution, they wrote that the director of the Tribal Historic Preservation Office would be a tribal member. And in that resolution, it also stated that the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer would be a Lakota speaker. And then they put together a four-year degree program. It was called the Cultural Resource Management and since then, we have had seven graduates. One graduate went on to uh, some place in England that was uh, for her master's. But now she's working for the uh, Yosemite National Park. One graduate who is Skawi Chasha went on to the uh, US forestry. He's working down in Arizona. Another member is working, uh, another graduate is working with the Cheyenne Eagle Butte uh, tribe. One graduate, Liz Hopkins, uh, left us some time ago. And so the three tribal members that have this four-year degree is Dira Ayat, Aniva Stans, and myself. And within this uh, cultural resource management degree, we, we were taught all about our culture. We were taught to speak the language. We were taught to know about our social systems, our tribal government, our treaties. There are so many other things on, on the Lakota side of uh, this program that we learned from Uncle Victor. Now, the other side of the program consisted of uh, anthropology, archaeology, uh, a cultural, cultural resource management one, which covered the laws and the 206 process and the contracts and the bids and all the legal uh, aspects to the CRM program. The CRM2 consisted of uh, applying repatriation, applying 206 process, and the other legalities of the program. Now, the CRM3, that consisted of what it would take to put together a tribal TIPO program. And being one of the first students that graduated with this program, or with, with this degree, I wrote a CRM program specifically for the tribe. That, that paper I wrote was then taken to the tribe 
to use as a model for the Rosebud Sioux Tribe TIPO program. So that is kind of the history of the CRM program. We did extensive field work. We have much experience in that. Um, we did we did a lot of uh, field work and surveys for the Oglala Sioux Tribe because they didn't have any. With the four-year degree program, you are certified. You are a certified archaeologist, so you can go out and do surveys. And I believe that I may be wrong, but I do believe that the Oglala Sioux Tribe when they went up against the KXL pipeline, the surveyors, when they got into court, the surveyors were asked, are you certified? And when they, when they had to say, no, we're not, that is how KXL won that court case, because there was no certified surveyors. So we might want to think hard about who we're going to hire. I heard two people up here say, get an education and work for the tribe. But in that program, that is not happening. We got three degreed people who could very well be a good part of that program. We could help. We have the knowledge. We have our own language. We have our own cultural knowledge. We have our own way of doing things using the laws. If you didn't get past the laws, the CRM1, you might as well drop out because that's how intensive it was. So when, after I got my degree, I started teaching. I started teaching some of these courses under Dr. Akerd. And then when I left and he made his journey, the, the program stopped. But we did get a couple more graduates that were ready to graduate at the time. So I'm giving you a little bit of that, a little bit of the history of the CRM program, letting you know that we have, that I know of, these two young ladies that could be an asset to the tribe. An asset. Think about that. Now the other thing, the other part of what I would like to say is that Within this program, we had a course called Ethics. Ethics. And within that ethics course, we had elders, Uncle Albert, Victor, others, come and talk to us about our thinking and our behaviors because we are working with the ancestors. We had to behave accordingly. We had to walk our talk. And I'll give you an example. We were out to the Oglala country doing a survey, and we were at a site where there were numerous artifacts just laying around. So I was looking around, watching everybody survey, and then when I took a step to move away, I had a shot go through my right leg. And so when I looked down, there was like a thumb, my thumb here, about that big of a rock. And there was a certain color. And so I got down and I took the dirt away, I dug it out. It was a paleo axe head. A paleo axe head, and I was like, wow, 
look at what I found. And Dr. Akert says, I wanted to find one. All these years I've been doing this, as she's standing on one. But it wasn't that I found it. It found me. It was shown to me. And some of you that I did some survey work with for the Corps of Engineers and the tribe out by the Missouri, you know that there was millions and millions of rock, big and small. Millions and millions of little pieces of wood. Wood that was waterlogged. Wood that is waterlogged when it dries, it looks like bone. And so we were on an ATV, another lady and myself, Rose Stenstrom, and I passed a certain area because I was driving. And I went about half a mile and I thought, I can't do this. I, I'm not going to sleep over this. So I turned around and I went back. And right where I had that feeling. And again, just a little piece of the rock was showing. So when I uncovered it, and Jennifer remembers this, was a projectile point. But I didn't find it. It showed itself to me. And then again, along the banks, the banks were about like 20 feet up. There was one little piece of wood way up there. And there was millions of pieces of wood, big and small. But when I looked up on a bank, one, that one little piece bothered me. So again, I turned around, I went back, I climbed up the bank, got it, it was a human bone. So I went on top of the bank, and there was the, it might have been the relatives, Arikara's burials, the circular mound burials. And I'm telling you this because when you are not in a good state of mind, when you are not with good heart, good intentions, when you are not clean, you're going to miss things out there. So if we had had people not in a good state of mind, how many sites have we lost? Because that's what I was taught, and that's what I believe, and that's what I experienced. And the people that I worked with know that that is so. So with all this training, why are we not in that TIPO office? If we're saying, come and get your education and you will use it to benefit the tribe. Why is that not happening? I think that um, with the, the legislators, the council, they really t need to take a good look at their, their ordinances and their laws. If they haven't already, they should take a really good close look at the ordinances. And they will know that a council, maybe not them, but another council, made those ordinances. They made those laws. So that their own people could thrive and flourish. So I give some encouragement to the council and to all of us that if we are going to live and if we are going to thrive as people, we need to do it the right way. We need to follow our own laws. We need to follow our own education. So with that, I will leave you thinking, hopefully. Pila Mayapi.
Itaki api. Iuha chinte washte na nambe choose api. Chokata upi we me. Mamli ohiti ka tiosh pa e mata na matko loser ha he wa teach to. My relatives uh, greet you with a good heart. My name is, they brought her in the center woman. Um, my English name is Dira Ayat. I'm from the Swiftbird community and I come from uh, the Brave Eagle extended family. Um, today, um, I'm quite humbled and I'm very honored to be up here. Um, I am a 2014 graduate of St. Egleska University. Um, I'm a cultural resource specialist. Um, I, along with uh, uh, Ione had just mentioned us, Lila um, Wopila Chichia. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Bill Eckerd was my mentor. Um, he left to the spirit world in April of 14, and I walked across the stage in August. Um, it was a tremendous loss for this university when he left, but the work and uh, the drive that he put into his uh, program, it, it's displayed very well all over the country. And I'm very proud to be one of his students. Um, when I graduated, um, I, was, I was very stoked. Um, the classes that were offered here at St. Eglishka were really intense and they were very immense as well. Um, Dr. Eckerd, produced a curriculum that was so unique, the ability, then you probably weren't going to finish his program. I, I was one of his only students to be in a class, but uh, they let me take the class, all you and your instructor. Um, Ina Waiyaki herself was a graduate of the Lakota Studies Department too. So um, they were thrown out and she had the creation uh, epidemically, whether it's alcohol, um, drugs, you know, um, loss of our language, loss of our culture, Asintegleshka steps in and they always uh, lead the way with, um, you know, trying to teach on. Um, the cultural resource management program um, essentially is what holds this reservation together. Uh, the, the laws that are involved with it, uh, the National Environmental Protection Act, uh, that's a very heavy law. In fact, um, when the hog farm fight was done, that's what was used to win it. And so, you know, we, it's in these laws um, that the government have uh, put down on us where we look into it and that's how we get them back. Um, we no longer can go out guns blazing at them, but we can use our nasula and we can get things done with our brains. Um, I really, really feel that um, our largest resource, which would be our forest, um, we need to take a better look at that. Um, his, historically, um, you know, we're a strong people. Uh, Sintegleshka, um, he picked this area in general because of uh, the forest. It was to um, hold proper timber for our fires and for um, building homes. Um, it had all the pejuta that you could ever imagine. It's a little black hills. And so we would be able to sufficiently take care of ourselves on our own lands. And that's part of what cultural, oh, they were up here showing us um, kind of what they go through. You know, that's just a small piece of it. Um, they're there to take care of us so that the longevity of Sichangu Lakota is never jeopardized. They're here to make sure that 500 years from now, our kids are still speaking Lakota, that our kids are still knowing they're tied to this ground, that our kids are getting dirty because that's the way it's supposed to be. Hechumse. Tunkashila Wakantaka gave us this land. He let us borrow it. We are just stewards. No one in this room owns one piece of dirt. That dirt is who we are. It owns us. And it is up to us to be able to take care of this land and to appreciate it in a way where the land gives back to us. And we've, we've kind of stepped away from that part. Um, cultural preservation is 
many avenues. Um, I believe this year um, the Department of Interior and the different uh, government factions that give out the money, I think there was like a $2 million increase into what the tipples will receive. I think the SHPO or the State Historic Preservation Office will receive roughly about $52 million. And I think uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Offices got a, a $2 million increase, which takes us to about $13 million. Now, I don't know how much will be appropriated down to the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, but within those small trickles of money, we have to look at our homelands. We, we have to look at what projects are important here. Our people need to know that our lands are more important than traipsing off over into other states and serving things that are important to what? BLM? Wangea? We're Sichungu. We need to take care of our own lands before we go out and take care of other lands. We need to instruct our people who are in power to start teaching our children. We need to get them out there and get them dirty. When it comes to our forests, when it comes to our lands, there's so many different properties that we could be teaching and instructing. There's zoology, which is the study of all of human life and animals. Then we have dendrology, which we really need to get into because that's the study of the woods. And our forest is becoming susceptible with climate change. There's a lot of uh, wabushka that have recently awakened and we don't know what they're gonna do to the woods. And so next, you know, we have to get in and we need an entomologist to come in because now our soils are getting contaminated and new bugs are coming to life. So now we need someone to get in here and educate us on these bugs so we can understand them. We just had a major bark beetle infestation and it almost took our forest. These are huge impacts that can jeopardize how far we go. Uh, we're always talking about seven generations, but I'm pretty sure we're already into the ninth right now. And so, you know, I guess those prayers for our land, maybe you can times them by seven, you know, seven generations times seven. You know, that's a thousand years that we need to pray for, for the future of our lands, because it's our land that we're going to have everything on. Um, it's the land that we walk on, that we stand humbly on. Um, we really need to think about the animals. Um, there's so many different aspects that I could just keep going and going and going, but I can hear the Itkancha's Tezi growling, so I better, <laughs> I better break. So, but I just want to say that I would encourage everyone, if they can, to, um, you know, to get into your culture, uh, you know, to learn your language, to learn about the land, and especially the laws, because it is these laws that we have to fight with, you know. Um, we have to take these laws, if we have to, all the way to Washington, D.C. And let's use our brains, you know, he told everybody, you know, we must put our minds together so that our children may live. And, and we have to, you know, there's no reason or there's no way that we have to use like um, jealousy. Those are all just human traits. One of we're spirits. And we need to tie those spirits back into our land so that our lands can flourish and our children can live happily. So with that said, um, I thank all of you guys for coming. Um, and I hope that you know, we get more people that are involved with our land. Um, thank you to the Tipo for coming. Thank you, Ion. And um, just enjoy your day. Wopila. Yeah, we got some on Rosebud. But it's also sad that we have a lot of our graduates who are not employed anywhere. And we need to, I was watching uh, Phoenix Hawk out here, what he had to do to a while before uh, to get it going so we could have our uh, sunrise ceremony. But during that time, I saw as a tough scene to that commitment to go to school and to be up and ready. And many of our students are young mothers or young fathers themselves, and they've got family responsibilities. Some work also in addition. They're very proud of our students who come to St. Jagalishka University and who hang in there 
and who graduated, like you heard two of them uh, talk here. So any uh, vendors out there, uh, it'd be good to look towards our graduates to put them to work to help us, but we also need assistance ourselves. And our hope is that we can expand into these areas and we can get our cultural resource program back again. And we have the people to resurrect that along with many other programs that we're going to be talking about and are talking about. In the meantime, we have students getting ready to eat in the other room, so we'll ask Laird Crow Dog to give him a spiritual plate to say a prayer for our meal, but we'll continue. We'll, uh, we'll eat after our students do, so there's still time to, uh, for somebody to come up here and say something after Leonard prays. Thank you. We'll uh, continue with the cultural aspect of it, so who uh, might want to be the next speaker up here to address any aspect of our culture, whether it's the cultural area itself. And we've heard some awesome talks this morning from the heart about the land the sacred sites, the early ancestry and where they lived, the medicines, the forestry. We have other areas about the language, the treaty, the history. So somebody wants to come forward and uh, talk about these, the mic is here. Thank you.